Good morning, church. God's love is great. Isn't it? His love is overwhelming. As we learn in 1 John, God is love. Love is inseparable from his existence. It is his very being. We've done our best to capture this in song. We just... We just try to sing about God's love for us, but there's not enough words. The the words aren't sufficient to convey our emotions. Are we just saying, what love, my God, so gracious and extreme? Because to us who know Christ, God's love is extreme. We can't possibly love God like God loves. Apart from God, we have almost no frame of reference for the kind of love that gives so sacrificially. Almost no frame of reference. There are a select few things in this life that give us a glimpse of the kind of love that God has for us. And perhaps the most profound thing that comes close to the kind of love displayed for us in Christ's sacrifice is the sacrificial love a mother has for her child. Enduring pain, suffering to bring new life. What a beautiful picture of God's love. Not only that first sacrifice, but mothers continually give of themselves, both every day, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Yes, mothers uniquely picture God's love for us in a way that we can begin, maybe even start to understand God more. What a gift to have godly mothers. Amen? Happy Mother's Day. But even a mother's love is just a taste, a sprinkle of God's love for us. So lest we think that our God is a distant God who cares very little about us, his creation, he took on flesh and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross for his children. And again, his love is overwhelming. Our scripture today is all about God's love, though it never uses that word. Let's stand together and read it. Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Again, Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Please be seated. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity now to come once again to your word. We are excited about it. We know that you always have things in store for us. So Spirit, we pray that you would move in our hearts and in our minds. We pray that you would renew our minds upon Christ, mold us and shape us into his image now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week, we started the fourth discourse of the Gospel of Matthew, which spans the length of chapter 18. We looked at the first nine verses and stopped, and today we're going to look at just these four verses, and next week we're going to go all the way through uh, verse 20. But really, verses 1 through 20 are a continuous answer to a single question the disciples raised to Jesus. They are connected together and dependent upon one another. So even as we slow down and consider these 20 verses over three weeks, keep in mind that they aren't independent of the rest of the discourse. They have to fit in. We have to read them connected together. These four short verses we're covering today give us three aspects of the relationship that God has with his little ones. First, God sees his little ones. God sees his little ones. Remember, Jesus began this discourse because the disciples asked him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
They wanted to know which of them would be Jesus' number two. And in response, Jesus does something pretty astounding. Remember, he calls a, a boy to him, and he sets them in the midst of the disciples, a little boy. And he says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Their whole understanding of the kingdom was off. And so last week we saw that they needed a hard reset in their understanding of the kingdom. Those who enter the kingdom of heaven must be like children. They understand that they are not worthy of salvation and that they view themselves as completely dependent upon God for all things. They have to be born again. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus gives an answer to that. It is this lowly child. Those are the only people in the kingdom of heaven, and they are also the greatest. And Jesus shifts from using the word child in verse 5 to the phrase little ones in verse 6, and he means the same thing by it. He means lowly disciples. Little ones are lowly disciples, which should be and must be in the kingdom of heaven, every disciple. And so while Jesus' words include children, we aren't just talking about children anymore. Jesus is calling his disciples to be childlike in their discipleship, lowly and humble. He's calling us to do the same. In verse 10, Jesus gives his disciples a command. He says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. What would it mean to despise a little one? At the very least, it would be going against verse 5. Whoever receives one such child receives me. It would be the opposite of receiving one such child. Last week, we talked about the act of receiving, that it's welcoming into fellowship and showing hospitality, extending kindness and value, bringing into community, caring for someone. So the opposite of that, despising a little one, is rejecting a lowly disciple and not extending hospitality, which can be church-wide, or it can be from a personal heart. In effect, Jesus was encouraging his disciples to extend the loving care and welcoming spirit Jesus had extended to them because they are lowly disciples. Jesus had many in his circle that weren't the kinds of people polite society associated with, not just fishermen, although they certainly would have been lowly. Matthew, for one, belonged to that camp. As a tax collector... He would, have been, he would have been despised and rejected from the community as a whole. He would not have been welcomed into the assembly. But, but there were others like him that Jesus welcomed time and time again. He came to save the unrighteous from their sins. Which means that were, there were all kinds of people around him who had troubled pasts. Jesus' disciples were supposed to go to the same kinds of people. They were to bring the message of salvation to the lost and broken. And that's exactly what they did. In the early church, the gospel exploded in the lower classes in the Roman Empire. Slaves, tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners of all kinds were welcomed to the church. The early Christian church was even looked down upon by Rome because of how many women and children were involved in it. But that doesn't mean that the church has always been perfect in this area. Maybe you've experienced it. I've heard rumors of churches, though I've I've not experienced one myself, who might turn away someone because they aren't dressed in nice enough clothes. Even worse are churches who might turn someone away because they have a different skin color or don't speak the same language. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been given for every person individually. It calls every man to repent and believe. But do we ever get out of step with that gospel call and despise little ones? May that never be said of our church. 
May this be a place where any and all people feel welcomed to belong to the household of faith, to believe the one true gospel. Amen? Amen. So we can commit the sin of despising God's little ones at a corporate level. Of course, those were just a couple examples how we could do that. But we can also do it at a personal level. And this is much more frequent. Despising someone could be something as simple as an unwillingness to welcome them into your community or looking down upon them, not taking them seriously. So Jesus places this little child in the midst of the disciples, these really important guys, and he tells them to view themselves like this little boy. He tells them to welcome this little one and not despise him, welcoming him like an equal. Welcoming a little one, a lowly person into community takes humility, a right view of yourself. The heart of hospitality sees other lowly people as no worse than you. You are a lowly disciple too. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are saved equally by his grace through faith in Christ. None are greater in the kingdom than the lowly child. It would be the greatest hypocrisy to confess that you are a sinner in need of grace, but to refuse a fellow grace-filled sinner from your community. That's unthinkable. That is not lowly discipleship. So, are there certain people that you would rather avoid? Are there those in the church who you hold at arm's length? Who you're glad they sit on the other side of the room? Are there those in the church you're unwilling to offer hospitality to, who you would cringe to have in your home? Are there those in the church that you despise in your heart? This is a chance to examine ourselves. Are there little ones that you despise? Jesus commands his disciples here to to love and welcome little ones and to repent of the sins of prejudice, and an unwelcoming spirit. But Jesus gives a reason for the command in the rest of the verse. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. In this little cryptic phrase, the location really matters. Notice how it says, in heaven, twice here. The angels of the little ones always see the face of the Father. Both the angels and the Father are in heaven. The angels are in the presence of God. God sees these angels. The angels see God. They are before God. And the point of this sentence is that God sees the lowly. The lowly always have a representative in his presence. Praise the Lord. Some have understood this verse to be speaking of guardian angels. Usually this doctrine of guardian angels goes beyond some of the evidence that we see in Scripture. Scripture tells us that the angels do work on our behalf and protect us. Psalm 34 verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Hebrews 1.14 says of angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? The answer is yes. So it's clear from God's word that angels are real and they are sent out by God to care for lowly disciples. But usually the idea of a guardian angel goes beyond that, right? Saying that we have all been assigned a specific angel and it's always by our side protecting us, which if that's the case, might be. We can't really prove it from Matthew 18.10 because these angels are associated with God's presence, God sees these angels before him. They are more like representative angels, which is a profound idea to wrap your mind around. There are angelic beings representing you before God for everything going on in your life. That's that's an amazing concept to dwell upon. On top of this, we're told that in 1 John chapter 2, Jesus Christ himself is our advocate before the Father. 
Again, wrap your mind around that. Not only do you have an angel or angels talking to God about you and God is interested in what they have to say, but the Son of God, the eternal God himself, advocates before the Father for you. What do you think about that? How does that make you feel today? Lowly disciples of Jesus Christ are represented before the Father always. And God sees them and cares about them. He knows what's going on in their lives. He cares about them dearly. Did you know that God sees you? For lowly disciples, that should be a source of great comfort. God will never forget about you. He's always aware of what you are going through. The implication of this truth for Jesus' disciples that day and for us is clear. God cares about these little ones. He does not despise them. He does not see them as worthless. Neither should you. The first aspect of God's relationship with his little ones that we learn in verse 10 is that he sees them, which is enough to try to digest today. Praise the Lord. Second, we learn that God pursues his little ones. Real quick, I want to point out that verse 11, if you have the ESV and other modern translations, is included in a footnote or brackets, which happened a couple weeks ago in chapter 17, so I won't spend as much time on it here as I did there. It's in a footnote for the exact same reason. All of the oldest manuscripts of Matthew don't include verse 11. The oldest are the most reliable and closest to the original. The text of verse 11 reads, The Son of Man came to save the lost, which is almost identical to Luke 19.10. So another well-meaning scribe put that in here to probably help introduce this famous parable. Jesus indeed did come to save the lost and wayward, so don't be concerned about its absence. In verse 12, Jesus asks a question that he often asks before a parable. Remember back in chapter 17, verse 25, Jesus asks the same exact question. He says, what do you think? It's an invitation to consider carefully what he's going to say. He wants his disciples to pay attention, consider deeply, meditate upon these truths. He wants us to do the same. Consider the depths of this familiar parable in verses 12 through 15. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives an almost identical parable with a couple important differences. In Luke, the parable is a little longer, and it's told to the scribes and Pharisees, not his disciples. The scribes and Pharisees are grumbling against the fact that the lowly are coming to Jesus. They are offended by the fact that Jesus is surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. And in Luke 15, the sheep hasn't simply gone astray, as Matthew says, but is lost. It is the lost sheep. And the shepherd, after he finds the sheep, throws a party for it, which doesn't happen here. Jesus includes a final statement in verse 14 here that doesn't occur in Luke. So taken all together with that evidence, Jesus must have told this parable more than once at least on two different occasions to two different crowds for two different purposes. So we're going to leave Luke 15, which is followed by the parable of the prodigal son. We're going to leave that alone, the parable of the lost sheep alone, and consider this text in Matthew. Properly understood, this is not really the parable of the lost sheep. This is the parable of the wayward sheep. We're presented with a common life situation that could be seen in Judea and Galilee all the time. A man owns about 100 sheep, which is a relatively small flock, though not tiny. 
And one of these dear 100 sheep has gone astray. Sheep, of course, are prone to do this. They need diligent care. The shepherd's hook is an important tool in this regard. Jesus presents this parable in the form of a question. If one of these 100 uh, 100 sheep go astray, does the shepherd not seek it? Right? Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? The question is asked in such a way that assumes a positive answer. Yes, of course. But during my study this week, the way Jesus asked the question made me stop and consider what would be my answer to that question. Jesus doesn't give any other details about the shepherd. He doesn't tell us if there is an under-shepherd with him or hired hands that he leaves the sheep with. He doesn't tell us that the 99 are put in a safe spot. Commentators have suggested that the shepherd must have hired hands around him. A hundred sheep would have been too many for one person. Others suggest that the shepherd could have a cave or some type of pen on the hills where the sheep could rest and stay. But Jesus doesn't mention any of that. And that seems intentional. All Jesus says is that the shepherd leaves the 99 to search for the one. Why would a shepherd do that? It seems incredibly risky, doesn't it? If I'm a shepherd and all I have are 100 sheep and that's my business, I'd probably think of them as assets, right? They are my wealth, my means to live, maybe even to care for my family. If I lose one, that stinks, oh well, but I can make it up during the next breeding season. But if I lose a large majority of my sheep because a wolf attacks or they fall off a cliff because I'm not there, then I'm literally ruined. Jesus assumes that the answer to his question would be a resounding yes. But I doubt that would be the disciples' first answer. This is an invitation to consider something deeper. The shepherd in this parable is God himself. Verse 14 makes that connection very clear. And the conclusion is simple. God does not view his people as assets. None of his sheep are losable. Each lowly disciple that belongs to the Lord is of indescribable value to God. It's like a shepherd leaving the 99 to search for one. That is the care that God has for his lowly and wayward disciples. When a disciple of Christ goes astray, the good shepherd pursues. God is the one who seeks the lost and the wayward. He is the one who brings them back. And this wayward sheep represents the disciple that has fallen away from the faith. There are many reasons why this might happen. Of course, the most obvious and the most common is that the lowly disciple has fallen into sin Sin has this habit of tearing us away from the Lord and the community of the faithful. When we go our own way, we leave behind the security of the saved community. But it's God who pursues the wayward. He does it himself. We might stumble and fall. We might fail to kill sin and be aggressive in doing so as we should. We'll have times where we, to borrow from Paul in the book of Romans, act like the old dead man we once were instead of the living man we are in Christ. But God seeks us out. He seeks us out and he brings us back. Have you experienced faithfulness, the faithfulness of God in that way in your life? Even when we fail in our faithfulness, God is faithful. Amen? Have you experienced that? Were you a wayward sheep, a disciple of Christ who has gone astray that God has brought back? Sometimes wayward disciples are wayward not only because of their sin, but because of hurt. Last week we talked about the harm That sinning against a little one can do. 
lowly disciples can wander away from the flock because it has been attacked by a hidden wolf. I don't want to press the parable too far, so I'll stop with the imagery, but maybe you were once a lowly disciple hurt by someone in the church, and so you gave up on it. You ran away. Maybe you've been reluctant to rejoin a church because of your past hurts. Take comfort in the fact that the good shepherd pursues you and brings you back. He doesn't let you remain hurt. He restores you. And we cannot understand this kind of love. We would be more willing to sacrifice one sheep on the mountains than let the whole flock perish. But God is like a shepherd who cannot even let one sheep go astray. It's how desperately he loves them. Verse 13 shows us God's heart to the lost and wayward. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Imagine the effort that it would take to find a sheep on the mountains. How long you would have to search, climbing over rough terrain. How worried you would be about the rest of the flock. Would the wayward sheep even want to come back with you? And after searching for this this wayward sheep, would your response be rejoicing? Like Jesus says, this shepherd rejoices? Or would you be relieved, but kind of angry, annoyed? with this wayward sheep, ready to drag it back. The picture of God that we see in this good shepherd is astounding. God is incredibly patient with his wayward sheep, and when they are found, he rejoices. Jesus says, the shepherd rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. The good shepherd is not content with just the 99. On first read, that, may, that statement may, may seem a bit odd, the statement Jesus makes, that he rejoices over it more than the 99. God isn't happy with the faithful? Of course he is. He rejoices with the faithful. But imagine the spike in joy that the retrieval of a wayward disciple causes. Heaven is overjoyed at the restoration of the wayward. If you are here today, and you consider yourself wayward, if you're confronted with your sin, or if you've felt rejected by God's people in the past, then take hope from this passage. God seeks you out, and he brings you back into the fold, and he rejoices over your restoration. And he wants to see it happen. If you are a wayward, lowly disciple this morning, Let the good shepherd bring you back. Let him rejoice over you and let us rejoice with him. God pursues his little ones. He loves them. They are not just statistics or assets to him. God cares about them individually. Do you believe that God loves you individually? Not just you in the future, the better you, the the you you want to be, the you without sin, but you right now. Do you believe God loves you individually right now? He loves you and he sees that you are worth pursuing. Praise the Lord. God sees his little ones and he pursues his little ones. And third, God sustains his little ones. Verse 14. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The Father's will is carried out by the good shepherd, the Son. John chapter 6, verses 37 through 39 are some of the most beautiful verses in Scripture. They say, this is Jesus speaking, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the good shepherd who brings in his sheep. Jesus always does the Father's will perfectly. All who the Father gives to Christ will come to him. 
God pursues the wayward sheep and he sustains the wayward sheep. It is not the will of the Father that his little ones, his dear little children should perish. Doesn't that give you assurance today? Of course, it assumes that you are a lowly disciple, one of God's little ones. If you are, that should give you the deepest assurance today. Doesn't it give you hope? Doesn't that calm your troubled heart and your anxious mind that God sustains his little ones? What is there to worry about in this life if the father protects his little ones? What are we but lowly disciples, sheep that are prone to wander that the father protects? The implications for the disciples hearing this are clear. You should do likewise. Just as the Father is concerned about and pursues his wayward sheep, so should his disciples, the other little ones. To extend the parable, the 99 should have been looking for the one, two. This is the work of the church. It is the call to pastoral care between church members. We are called to care for one another and even call each other back from the brink. We are the priesthood of all believers and we intercede for one another. And when we bring others back to the fold, we are carrying out the will of God for his little ones that they shouldn't perish. Jesus We'll flesh this out more in verses 15 through 20, where he gives his disciples practical steps to take in the new community about how to pursue and sustain wayward sheep. We'll look at those verses next week for today. Let's wrap up with another reflection on the love of God. God does not despise his little ones. He sees them. He welcomes them. God does not view you as a number or as someone he's okay with losing. He pursues you even when you flee from him. And because God is God, he is always able to accomplish his plan. Jesus always does the will of the Father and all his sheep will come to him God's love was shown to the greatest extent in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for you, individually. He took the penalty due for your sins and he paid it. So will you place your faith in him today? Will you repent of those sins and go with the good shepherd back to the fold? Be encouraged today by God's wonderful, indescribable love for you. Be encouraged by his sovereign care that brings us hope and assurance. And be assured in your salvation. Rest in his protection. He loves you. And it is not God's will that his little ones should perish. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. Something we don't deserve, but that we feel constantly from you. In many ways, countless ways. Lord, we thank you that you see us and every little thing about our lives, that you are intimately involved in it and that you care about us and that we can cry out to you and that you hear us because we have an advocate before the Father. We thank you that Even when we are faithless, you are faithful. You pursue us. And Lord, we thank you that you sustain us. That by your spirit, you are making us more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.